So you've got the three pieces. You've got community, you've got value to holders, and you've got balancing the economics. So community is a, it's become a buzzword. A lot of people talk about community and being community first, but are you actually? Today, I'm very excited to be joined by Ben Cohen. If you don't know who Ben is, you need to know Ben. He's the CEO and co-founder of Killabears, an NFT collection and an entertainment company. Ben, welcome to the show. How are you doing today? I'm good, Michael. Thanks for having me. How are you? I'm doing great. Super excited to have you on the show. Um, today, we're going to get into free mints and gamification for NFT projects. But before we go there, I would love to hear your backstory. How'd you get into Web3? How'd you get into NFTs? Start wherever you want to start. For sure. So I'm a 13-year internet entrepreneur veteran. So I've been in that, you know, founder CEO role for a long time now. And I've bounced around a bunch of different areas uh, of the internet. Started in mobile apps, uh, did social media, I've done some SaaS, gaming, kind of everything. Um, Long story short, um, I had my first crypto experience in 2013 with Bitcoin, and it's not actually that great of a story. I, I sold it way too early, and um, I always kind of thought about it, and I always wanted to get closer to it, but that experience was a little bit rough with my timing, and uh, ultimately, my video game company, uh, my partners pulled me in, and they said, listen, we've got to pivot our company towards nfts there's this crazy bull run going on right now and a lot of the teams out here uh you know don't have what we have so let's let's go for it and at the time i just said it, it seems like a lot of hype going on but why not uh let's go for it and and uh the killer bears was born you know about 18 months ago and then we minted just over a year ago um uh, you know, so that's kind of the backstory on how I got into this role and uh, operating. And uh, I mean, it's been uh, yeah, I would love to ask a couple of clarifying questions. So, before you started Killer Bears, you mentioned a video game company. Maybe you can tell us a little bit about that experience, just so people understand that. For sure. So, uh, we have a company called Umbrella Games, which is a casual game developer. Casual games are, you know, at least in this one, are their iPhone games, Android games that you play. Um, and we had a bunch of those that did pretty well. Three of the games hit top 10 on iTunes. And um, the most well-known is the game called Monster Merge. And um, yeah, I mean, we, we you know, we, we've... You know, the game, kind of the company game was it? What kind of a game was it? Just so people understand. A merging game, you know, so there's this board, basically, it, it's really colorful. And you have kind of like for like, and you have to merge them. And it's a highly addictive game. If, if anybody of, that's listening here plays it, they're going to curse me out later because, the, you know, 30 or 40 hours later, they're going to be like, what did you do to me? Like, you know, why, why did you do that? And, uh, you know, it, it's a really fun game. It, it, it was a hell of a game. You know, I'm curious, uh, I, what's the business model on those kind of games? Is it mostly advertising or is it subscription models or what's the deal with that? In the casual category, um, you've got, I mean, they're, they're all freemium. The freemium wave happened nearly a decade ago. So, you, you know, so at one point you could charge for these games that, that that's long gone. Now it's, it's advertising and there's a few different formats that are popular and there's in-app purchase. Monster Merge had a really good combination between the two. It was about 50-50 in-app purchase versus ads. And your background is more of an operator or a developer, or I'm just curious what... Yeah. Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm, I'm the business guy. My partners are, I always say it, they are the talented ones and I'm just the one that annoys them, you know, faster, 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 let's get stuff out. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm the operator. Yeah. So, so you said about 18 months ago, your partners came to you and said, hey, we've got to get into this space. Like... Take us back. Like, what was the conversation like, and why were they, why were they, they animate about the fact that you guys should start an NFT project? So, Mikkel, who's our creative director, he had been pretty active with NFTs, um, trading like you know, like everybody else, and um, he had some success doing that. And I think that his feeling was, you know, I, he 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 understood what the teams he was investing in, basically, and he and his feeling was always like, I, I really think that like these people don't have enough one just business experience, like they're just a little young, and two, they haven't built digital products, um, and we've built t 
tons. So his, his, his feeling was, his thesis was a little bit more mature operators, uh, a little bit more uh, battle tested, and I think you have a real chance of success. And so he first went to our CTO, my, my other partner, and said, I think you should start thinking about smart contracts. Uh, and he, he's an all around web developer. You know, games is his, his favorite thing, but he can do it all on the web. Uh, and then um, they started talking about it. And then as Bean, who's the CTO, got more comfortable with Solidity and all the different pieces that, you know, when he, when he kind of he had like the revelation that all of his skills kind of culminated well in Web3, they came to me and they said, all right, like we want to do it. Um, but we obviously are the creative and technical side. We don't have the business and the community side and marketing side of things that you are comfortable with. So if you're willing, let's get the three musketeers uh, together in this new place. And we've got this Mimo Angeles, our illustrator, his artwork is great. Uh, and I think, you know, we have a vision for this, you know, we talked and, you know, what was the long-term goal? And we had this understanding that we could go for, an entertainment company that looked a little bit like an Angry Birds of Web3. When I say that, we obviously know Angry Birds really well. Angry Birds started as an iPad game in the early iPad era, 2010, 2011, something like that. And they've went on to have Netflix series and, you know, in Target, you can find dog toys and children's backpacks with their brand. So that was kind of the, like the, the kernel of the idea. And then from there, um, you know, we began with the pre-mint process and, um, I think, you know, it's easy to say it now, but I think that we're well on our way uh, towards realizing that vision for sure. So you guys launched this, if I'm doing my math right, like around November of 2021, is that about right? Does that seem about right? Uh, no, that's when we kind of started talking about things and, okay. and getting into like adapting Memo's work. Uh, the Mint was April 13th of 22. Got it. So we're recording this in May of 2023, uh, almost a year later. So. Um, we're going to get into a little bit of, of uh, more about what, you know, Killer Bears has done and all that fun stuff, but kind of just um, maybe give us a couple of factoids of like how big is the collection today? Here we are like a year later and approximately how many people own the collection. And then we're going to get into a little bit about how you actually did the launch uh, specifically with a free mint, which I think is going to be a really fascinating discussion. For sure. For sure. So uh Killer Bears is a collection of 3,333 animated bears. So there are approximately, it's tough to know, I think the, 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 probably like 1,100 holders in the God. Genesis collection. Uh, we've got other collections. So the, the holder base is actually quite larger across the whole ecosystem. But uh, of the, the primary bears, uh, yeah, that's about 1,100. Yeah, well, go ahead and mention the other collections you launched as well. For sure. So we had uh, the Kilobits, which were airdropped for free to our holders. That was the the second, um, you know, uh, chapter of tokens. Uh, and those are uh, full body pixelated Kilobears. So if you owned Michael Kilobear 2000, you would have been airdropped in July, uh, basically a, a pixelated replica of your, of your, um, of, you know, a, a bear 2000. Uh, so same traits, same everything, just instead of uh, animated and kind of shoulder up um, on the JPEG, uh, you'd have full body and it'd be in pixel. And then from there... When you say pixel, do you mean like 64-bit or do you mean like fully rendered 3D? Y yeah, 64-bit. That's right. Got it. Okay, cool. And, uh, and from there, we, you know, we started to experiment with short-term staking, which is something that had not been done in NFT. And the rewards of those were, uh, you know, killer gear, which are weapons that you can use to equip to your bit. And most recently, we had a, a mint, I think three weeks ago, uh, for the killer cubs, which uh, was really long anticipated. That's kind of the big thing that people were waiting for. And uh, yeah, I mean, we minted out, um, and that's a collection of 8,888. And they're all kind of in, in incubation right now. So they're all growing in, in, in about a month. Um, they will be, uh, you know, full cubs and there's a lot of, there's a lot more to it. I don't want to get into those details now, but, but there's, there's a lot more in terms of designing your own cubs and things like that. 
Well, and one of the things that folks may not realize if you're not familiar with Killer Bears is they have achieved a very high floor price, um, unlike other collections. I think Killer Bears is actually above Moonbirds right now, if I'm not mistaken, right? Because Moonbirds has dropped like 90%, you know, down to like 2.1 ETH. And I think you guys are somewhere higher than that for sure, right? And you started as a free mint, which is also a fascinating concept. We're going to get into that a little bit more. But I know I, I know people in your community that are extremely evangelistic and loyal about what you guys are doing. And that's why I think there's some really fascinating things we can talk about today. But before we do, there are some people that are listening right now that may be creators or slash creatives who want to start a collection or are entrepreneurs who maybe used to work inside of a different kind of business and see Web3 and want to launch an NFT collection or maybe even marketers working at any size business that are thinking about getting into this space, um, why should businesses consider launching an NFT project? What's the upside in, from your take? That's a, it's, a, it's a great question, but it's, it's a, it, the answer is not black and white. So what I would say is, is I think the era of the PFP collections, I, I think they've basically passed us, but I don't think that there's room for more PFPs. I think the number... I was on a, uh, another podcast and it's that NFT stats guy. And he, he, he is like a number whiz. It's, uh, and we talked out offline after there's Talk something like se- proof collective pass. Was it the proof and uh, the proof? It was uh, the proof pod. Yeah. Yep. With, uh, with, with the punk guy. And yep. uh, we spoke after and basically the math is something around there's 70,000 PFP collections, 70,000. There's my and my feeling on on that number is there's probably enough liquidity and teams doing enough to support twenty to forty of those. I don't think I don't you know it's just there was a crazy bull run and 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 a lot of people got in the game and and and, it, and that's that's what happens with you know in this world. But for people that are marketers or creatives or people that want to participate in Web three that have a background maybe like mine or, or like somebody else that's been in kind of the New York and the California tech scene for a long time. I think there's huge opportunity. I just don't think it's in PFPs. I think the opportunity is in educating, onboarding, uh, how all these things work. I think that, it, I think it's kind of the, we've, I think that blockchain has provided the skeleton. I think PFPs gave people something shiny and fun to look at in a way to, kind of like, you know, it started with Top Shot. That was kind of the beginning of the craze. And people understood that because like, you know, like I'll pick up like a card here. Like, you know, suppose this was a Derek Jeter rookie card, right? And I was a kid that collected sports cards, which I was. If you just said to me, I didn't know anything about blockchain, Ben, you're not going to believe this, but there's a digital version to that Derek Jeter sports card. You're going to love it. That, that's what created this whole thing. And then the next evolution with the Board API Club and everything that, you know, went after was very, you could trace it back to Pokemon or, or to sports collecting, but I think now that's gotten cluttered. So what's left is a huge amount of meat on the bone for entrepreneurs to create product and ideas and communities and, and content around the rest of what the blockchain can deliver us. So, I think there's literally nothing but opportunity. I think I spend a lot of my days wrestling with what Web3 doesn't have yet. And I think that's simple onboarding, educational content. And there is a lot of it, but there probably needs to be more of it for different audiences and different communities and different locations. So I would say, look where there's white space. Uh, the white space is definitely not in PFPs. So uh, that's kind of my spiel on, on it. I think uh, I've had a lot of time to think about it. I think that the big winners in this next class are going to be evaluating the problems that haven't been looked at yet. Well, I love your counter uh, interpretation because so many people that I've had on this show from various other NFT projects have different perspectives than you, but um, it's a legit proceed with caution kind of warning. And we are in this era where price is going nowhere but down as of this recording, right? And it's getting harder and harder to get people to understand this space. I would imagine there might come a day where maybe it's less about every NFT being a different picture and maybe the NFT being an access credential or membership, right? Those kind of models, I think, still have probably opportunity, right? Because you could have done it that way. 
you might have done it that way in hindsight. Is that what I'm hearing you say? No, I think we're in the right place. I mean, you know, we 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 are we wanted to be an entertainment company. With entertainment, you need characters, you need right. storyline, you need lore. Right. Um, and if you saw the video games that we made, you would re- you would see that cosmetically we we like pay a lot of attention to the details. So for us, it, it made sense. I do think we were one of the last ones uh, that kind of made it in before the door closed. Um, right. That just and I think the circumstances of why we ended up being a free mint. I think there, th- there's a lot there. But um, well, let's talk about back that. I, yeah, let's talk sure. about that. So um, that's a great transition to my next question about free mints. Um, First of all, um, explain what you did with your free mint and then talk about why they work, you know what I mean? And, and why they might be a model worth pursuing for others that are listening. So our mint was not supposed to be free. It was supposed to be charged. Oh. Um, and what happened was I think that we basically caught, I think we, we were like at the inflection point between bull run and bear. Run. I think that we literally caught like the day that people said, I'm tired of paying for mints. I'm tired of being scammed or rugged or, or you know, whatever, whatever, however they felt about it. Tired of losing, whatever it was. I think that everything had run its course macroeconomically. I think things were beginning to change, and um, so you know, we 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 had an oversubscribed whitelist. So we, you know, heading into the mint, we felt like, you know, it wasn't going to be particularly hard for us to mint out. You know, we're if you looked at just like our team on paper and all the materials that we put together, I think we looked like a a put together bunch and, you know, certainly a little bit older than most uh, more experienced. And we actually could probably deliver what we were saying we were going to, but uh, that day, I remember gas was particularly high on, on the network and uh, we opened the mint. We sold just a few, like 75 NFTs and then kind of the music stopped playing and, it was a quick decision, you know, that we FaceTimed each other and said, listen, we don't really need a, you know, a full a full treasury of Ethereum to operate. We we've, we already have a functioning business with our games and, you know, we've, we've had success. So, uh, if, you know, we've already built out a lot of this roadmap. If we don't have the treasury, it's not going to stop us. So why don't we just optimize for minting out and, and let our story begin? So that's what happened. We uh, just said, all right, let's rip the bandaid off. Let's go free. At this point, nobody had done free mints. That was about one month before Goblin Town, which I think is the most uh, impressive free mint of, of, of the meta. But we, you know, we were a month prior and it was a shiny new thing. People hadn't heard of free mints. You know, it had only been paid mints up to this point. Ethereum was over $3,000 at the day of our mint. And um, yeah, yeah, I mean, it, you know, it's funny. I had I've had Alex Tob on our show, who um, you know is part of the crew that did Goblin Town, and he said to me that he felt like he struck lightning in a bottle, and they weren't expecting that kind of response. I wouldn't be surprised if maybe they watched what you were doing because. Um, so, what ended up happening when you made it free? Like, explain the market dynamics of what happened once that happened. So we so okay. So what what was we did something unintended that I think created an incredible amount of, uh, of demand. So when we, when we, you know, you're supposed to have a 24 hour whitelist. So when we decided to go free, the one condition was you needed to be on the whitelist. Mm. What happened was news got around really fast around everyone's discords and Twitter groups and all that, that there was a free mint going on. They were coming into our discord in, 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 in the thousands. It's not even the hundreds and the thousands and people saying, and we were we were manually taking people's wallets and pasting them into our whitelist. And if you looked at our Discord, it was like you couldn't even copy people's addresses because it was just like raining addresses. What happened is, is we did it, we did it, we did it. Eventually, we were like, "This were is you impossible." Any tools to make this simple, I would imagine back then, like pre. No, 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 no. It was be- it was me and a couple of others copy and pasting, and basically, I like messaged the group, and I was like, "Guys, we literally grew our Discord by like twenty to thirty thousand people in the last hour because wow. they heard about a free man." I said, "Let's just open it to general public. Let's finish this thing. This is too much. This is like too much stress. Like I was like, I'm too old for this. You know, I was 34. I'm 35 now. And uh, what happened was so many people had shown up to our discord to get whitelisted, to go and get a free Q 
kill a bear that when the thing minted out and they showed up in our discord and realized that they missed out, they had complete FOMO and they went straight to open sea. And we and this had mean commissions were still getting paid right back then. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and our, uh, we had just a huge volume, you know, we had hundreds of ETH in hours of volume and IC tools, open sea, you know, IC tools, we were number one, open sea, we were in the top 10 and volume. And that's kind of how our name got out there. Uh, it, you know, it was purely, we were just kind of doing what we thought was the most fair and, and then we had no choice. It was too overwhelming to deal with that whitelist. So, but that's really what gave us that momentum. Those first 24 hours, we did like a thousand ETH in volume and, and uh, our name, you know, the killer bears were born, you know, that was kind of all the marketing that we needed in that moment to get. And then basically after that, once the dust settles on everyone, just kind of flipping and, and, and dumping and, you know, whatever they're going to do, you know, a real community begins to form and, we made sure that we were really out in the open. We were obviously not anonymous. We showed a lot of the stuff that was in, that was already in development. And we were trying to explain our experience that, you know, having three top tens in the app store, you know, it means we've had over 40 million downloads lifetime, which is a big deal and all the other successes in our career. So we were just trying to prove that we were real, that we were here, that we had really good intentions and, um, you know, we, we, we built that connection with the community really early on, and we've obviously stayed really close to, to them. And I think that's been a thing in Web3 that a lot of these projects and collections in the bull run, um, I think they just had so much success that they just said, like, you know, we need to have a lot of separation from the community. And we basically did the opposite. We said, let's work with the community. Let's learn with the community. The feedback loop that they give us for free uh, is like the most valuable tool that we'll ever have. So let's use it and let's 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 make them a part of it. That's kind of the ethos of Web3 anyway. And we kind of just doubled down on it. And I think ultimately we kicked off the free meta with that. And uh, I think the meta went kind of crazy and and, and, and and you know eventually it ended. You know, and that's what happens. You know, things right now we're in the altcoin meta. You know, everyone's doing meme, meme coins and in a couple of weeks, that'll be over too. You know, it's it's just one of those things that, you know, you, you can only have lightning in a bottle so many times. I think we had it. I think Goblin Town had it. Uh, couple there's other. only a couple of, there's yeah. a couple other names from that time I can remember, but yeah. there's, you know, out of thousands of mints, there's only maybe right. five I can even name. Right. So um, this unintended what I'm hearing you say is like, hey, it wasn't selling. Um, and you guys decided to make this snap decision to make it free because you didn't need the money coming in from the sale of the NFTs to be able to fulfill the mission. Instead, you just needed a loyal community uh, behind the project. And unintended consequence was mass demand because you had to be on the allow list. It wasn't just for anybody. And then you had all these tens of thousands, it sounds like, of people that were in the Discord that missed out on the Mint, and there was a lot of sales on the, on the secondary market in OpenSea. So was the price very rapidly going up in the first couple of days? Do you remember what happened? Yeah, it went to about 0.2, I think was the highest floor in that first, in that first little while. Uh, what was, the, what was your launch price planning to be before you decided to flip the switch? 0 0.05 for the whitelist and 0 0.08 for the public. Okay. So you made some good money, it sounds like, with the volume on the uh, secondary sales, which helped fill that treasury up. And in hindsight, turned out to be a really smart move. That's kind of what I'm hearing you say. Is that fair to say? Yeah. Yeah. Ultimately, I think everything went exactly the way it needed to go. I think we, uh, we managed the momentum that we got, you know, and, and we, you know, we used it well going forward. And yeah, I, I, I'm glad it worked out this way, for sure. Well, let me ask you this question. Is there any reason that someone else couldn't use this playbook of having a uh, allow list, activity, getting people in the Discord, requiring that they be on an allow list, getting them into the Discord to create a lot of um, demand, and then rewarding maybe just the most active members in the Discord the opportunity to, to mint? Um, is there a reason why this couldn't also apply, assuming they've got a good team behind them and they're trying to model a little bit of what you're doing? Is this possibly replicatable um, when they just have to pay gas fees? I think it's, I think, yes, I think it is. I think it's, it's, it's tough because when these things happen, 
everybody starts to come out of the work and doing them. And that makes it that that makes it so that the, 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 there's diminishing returns every single time this happens. However, it's been a year really since the free mint meta. And I think as I think anything can work as long as you've got the right game, you know, the right game plan and the right people and the right messaging. But I don't I think the playbook is solid. I just sometimes it's like a moment in time uh, right. that you need to, right. you know, that, but yeah, the playbook is looking back. I could, I could, I could tell you exactly every single thing we did um, and why it helped. Uh, I think the playbook is sound. I, I, even if we didn't intend on all of it, the, 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 well, the decisions we made worked. The meta, the repeat of what, you did with soft with with games free games right like you already knew free equals revenue right i mean you'd already proven that out in the software uh, gaming space right so this kind of wasn't foreign for you guys to do something for free that ultimately would have value later would you agree with that yeah yeah, i actually never thought of that i think the thing with games is you know we made about 45 games if i had to do the math Okay, it would probably be like this. 45, 45 total games produced by our company. 35 were probably, I would say, they were not very good. Now, they looked good. They felt good. They played well. But economically, the retention curves, the monetization, they weren't there. Then there was probably six, seven games that were solid. Solid, like People played them for a number of days and a number of hours, and and uh, were, were good. And then there were there was three or four that like were were really strong. But what you learn is with a free game, the users decide if they like it. Is the product good enough? You know, is everything balanced well enough for them to actually want to be here and, and continue participating? With NFT, I think it's exactly the same. Free mint is an attractive entry because they just pay some gas, and and, and now they've got the thing. Once you've got the thing, what happens next, right? For us, I think, you know, we had a lot of experience. We had a lot of ideas. We had a clear vision and we had the team to execute that. So we had the product to deliver. So the people that received that mint or inexpensive killer bear, they were impressed with the product. And I think it's the same as the games. It, it, you know, if you get the game, it's free. You spend five minutes, you say, okay, this is a little different. I'm going to, I'm going to keep going here. There's, there's tons of stuff on the app store, but this one is keeping my attention. And I think that that's kind of what happened here. So yeah, I mean, I never even thought about that, that the freemium game and the free. That's hilarious. They haven't, you haven't really modeled that in your mind. You I haven't had the that. time. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay. You got this community of people um, that, Probably a big chunk of them are initial holders, uh, you know, and they got in for free. Talk about what we need to be aware of with free mints. Let's talk about how to keep that value for those holders in place and maybe talk a little bit about economics and all that fun stuff because I know there's a lot of, and the community and all these things that we were talking about when we were prepping for this thing as far as like, you know, you yeah. got this free community. How do you keep them? So, so you've got the three pieces. You've got community, you've got value to holders, and you've got balancing the economics. So community is a, it's become a buzzword. A lot of people talk about community and being community first, but are you actually? So we actually are. I have a ton of conversations with the community and, you know, with one of my individuals, with different groups of people, you, we, I actually, we actually actively participate. We listen to their feedback. We ask for feedback, whether we're right, we're wrong. We could do better. We could do whatever the case may be. It's a two way street. And I think that that's, it's something in web three that people say, but they don't practice. Um, value to holders. That is not only monetary. I think that a lot of people mistake that. And I think that it's an important piece. You want people that are investing their time and their Ethereum in your, in your collection. You want to, you want to at least try your best to preserve what they're putting in, but value is not only monetary. I think there's a lot of other things. For example, we've said we're an entertainment company. What what does that look like? That looks like for the Killer Bears, at least one or two videos per week with some storyline that's happening, and, and there, there's you know there's a greater universe and story we're telling, and people absolutely love it. We try to merge current events into these these pieces of content and. Uh, people take that as a lot of value. Another thing is we have this dashboard, which lets holders access all of their uh, their NFTs that they own within our collection. 
and make different banners and different pieces of art. They can export them in video, in, in image, you know. So, you know, th there's digital experiences that we make with staking and things like that, where we obviously are showing qualities that we have with, you know, uh, you know, with our experience in mobile and web dev and design. And these are all things that our community would say to you and our holders would say to you, these are pieces of value that are given back to us that we get to enjoy. It's not only about the floor price. We actually are experiencing innovation in Web3 with these guys that run Killer Bears. The third thing, and it's tied a little bit to the monetary one, it's the economics of, of what we have at play here. Um, the math that goes behind NFT collections like really can't be taken lightly. It's complicated stuff. And, um, you know, we've put a ton of attention into that. We've even brought in some outside people to help us with uh, the tokenomics. And ultimately that delivers a lot of value back to holders because most of the things that we put out, whether it's companion collections, uh, rewards for staking, things like this, they're very thoughtful, not only from a cosmetic sense and a storytelling sense, but they actually have a place within the ecosystem so that the numbers typically will go up uh, because they've been thought about. So those are kind of the three pillars of, of how uh, I think about, you know, this side of the house. I love this. Uh, and we're going to get into tokenomics and gamification in a little bit here. Well, actually right now, I, I would love to hear, gamification as a concept when it comes to an nft project um first of all what does gamification mean in this in this regard because obviously we know what gamification means when you're using an app on your iphone but we may not understand it here and why is it so important so it's i'll try my best here so the thing with games is there's typically more than one way to beat the game right so you have this let you have this you have this intellectual question of how am I going to strategically pass this obstacle, whatever? There's, you know, there's, there's more than one strategy. In NFT, we, we try to apply the same thing, which is people will have different perspectives on what's important, what they like, and, how, and there are motivations for being here. There's some people that are here just for the community. They don't care about the floor price. There's some people that are here as flippers and traders, and all they want to do is make some money. And there's people here that want to passively hold because they believe in what we're doing, or they believe in Web3, and they want some exposure. And there's people that are aggressively holding, and they're you know, feverishly waiting with notifications on for every announcement we do. If you, it, it, The way we saw it was... We need to give all of these different types of all these different cohorts something to enjoy or not. They're all not going to have the same motivation. So we need to give them a different thing. Now, they all have the same assets if they want them, but how they proceed with them is up to them. Gamifying it simply means here's the pieces of the puzzle. Here's kind of the rules of the game. So this is kind of the ecosystem. We call it the killiverse. And the gamification is that you, Mike, versus, versus me, versus my friend down the street, interpret all that information differently and decide to proceed differently uh, based on what your object objectives are and how you kind of understand it. So are they uh, earning most, tokens in this particular case? That's what we're really talking about, right? Like, uh, yeah. it's, the tokenomics is the key thing here, right? They can earn rewards or tokens in exchange for different actions and use those to do different things. Is that kind of what I'm hearing you say? For sure, for sure. And there's different ways, there's different like, you know, like I've done a lot of internet marketing and there's like the term arbitrage. There's In every system, no matter who you are, th there's no system that's been armed more than Facebook's ad manager, for example. Uh, no matter how big or, or, you know, how big the company, how many engineers there are, there's always opportunities uh, and white space in digital product. So, that's kind of the thing with the economics is some people kind of look for the Arab opportunities and some people are just, they just appreciate that it's fun and that we've made this all interesting and that we've attached a storyline to it so that there's depth and, and they want to follow along and, you know, play it their way. We obviously have a little bit of an advantage because we've made games. So we understand level design, game theory, the balance between difficulty. How many times do you need to fail before we let you succeed? Um, if you don't have the balance right, it's too hard, it's too easy, you get people 
Have help it up, help us up. understand a little bit about like how this works behind the scenes for you guys. Like, um, let's say you hold a killer bear. Like, does it explain like a little bit of the gaming mechanics just so people understand? For that? sure. So like to start, um, if you have, so in, in the early days, in the first stake, the better example is the second stake, but I, I think we have to walk before I can, we, before we can run here. The Kilton Hotel is a, is, a, is a place we made where the science experiment basically happened, uh, the scientific study, 30-day study, which was a 30-day stake, and you had a kill a, the only requirements you had to have <clears throat> a kill a bear and a kill a bit. If you paired the two, you could go and stake. Every few days, you're the metadata of your bears and your, your bear and your kill a bit would change. One day you're in a quarantine, the next day you're in a at a bar having a drink. In the drink, there was this psychedelic thing, and now you're in this forest, and it, it continues, and there's a, there's an arc to the story. At the end of the 30 days, you've made it. Congratulations, okay? Um, you survived. You get a kill of gear. There was 12 different types of kill of gear, okay? There's there was really, there was common kill of gears, which are weapons that you could put on a bit, or and there's really rare ones, okay? There was 12, though. In order to go to the Killa Lab staking, which was a 45-day stake that had uh, similar, you know, another uh, storyline lower the whole the whole nine, um, you could stake differently. You could stake just a bear and a bit, no gear, or you could stake with a bear, a bit, and an equipped uh, Killa gear to the bit. Or one thing we had was if you wanted to burn, we had a grid. There was four across and three down. If you made, if you had certain combinations of, of the weapons, you could get a super weapon. So if you did the super weapon, you would burn like the three in the combination and you would have this special weapon at the end of it. And Were these all NFC collections? All these little things? Correct. Right? Kill a gear. And you can see that there's 19, uh, you know, total. In order to get like the really rare ones that are really expensive now, you had to burn three or four of the uh, anyway. So, so you had you had the different tiers. You had the basic stake. You had the stake with the with the basic one of the twelve weapons, or you had the super weapon. And obviously, the rewards were different per tier. So, if you had the super weapon and you were in that cohort, you had a shot or a greater shot at landing like a one of one at the end of the stake. And, and it kind of worked its way down like that. You had a shot in every, in every group, but the, the percentages were larger. People could, could decide how they wanted to play that. You know, there was, there, there was people that had, you know, very different points of view on how to do that. Some people said, I'm not going to bother with weapons. I'm just going to get as many bears and bits and I'm going to stake them and have the baseline rewards. And some people said, I'm going to only stake with top tier because I want to get the most rare stuff. And all are great strategies. You know, people say, what should I do? And I said, I don't know. You know, whatever you think is, is for you. You know, I can't tell you. They're all great. So, a couple quick questions. Uh, when you say staking, is this more like nesting with what Moonbirds does? Or is this actually transferring it into someone else's, into a different wallet? Uh, so those stakes are hard stakes. So they're in a different, they're in the staking wallet. I see. Um, so and they do transfer. Well, this is fascinating because this, this creates a, uh, a secondary market dynamic, right? Because all of a sudden you've got less bears up for sale because people are participating with the rewards, which increases the floor price, right? Yeah, I think, I think in some part, yeah. I mean, the, the percentage of people staked was, was pretty high. Th those windows have passed now, you know, so people still are staking there, but the, the participation rates when we opened them, you know, were very high. Like the day, the moment that we opened the stakes, I don't know, 60, 70% went in. Um, but yeah, it certainly helps with, with, you know, with supply, but that, that really isn't the reason we did it. The reason we did it was more, we wanted to tell a story and we wanted to introduce these new tokens, but we wanted to do it our way. And we thought that staking could have used a bit of innovation. So, you know, we dream, we dreamt up something different. So you said eventually you ran and you did something different. What did you do most recently? Um, right now we have the Cubs, which are in an eight-week incubation. And every week the metadata on the Cub changes. So like right now, if you stake like the day on the day of the mint, the embryo is like starting to grow feverishly and they're animated and, and all that. But we also have a, a soft stake 
a la moon birds, um, which is for a different purpose for the, the you know the killer bears at this moment. But yeah, and those are in wallet. Soft stake means they stay in your wallet. Hard stake means they go to a staking wallet. Was there uh, any kind of token or currency or utility token that's specifically used or earned through the staking process? Because I did think I heard you say tokenomics earlier. Um, or is it less about a separate token that you can burn to get these NFTs and more about just staking them to earn the NFTs? Correct. The, the, the latter. Yeah, okay. we, we, have, we have an elite, you know, a coin or, or you know, a proper uh, token like that. What have you learned from the gamification stuff? I mean, like any take home tips for anybody thinking about doing this that might be different than what you experienced in the video game space? I think for the average NFT collector of the last year and a half, two years, however long, I guess it's probably, it's probably like two and a half years since Top Shot now, our approach is, is interactive. And I think people have enjoyed participating. They say, this is fun. This is fun. We have something to look forward to. It's not just a JPEG that's collecting dust. There, there's something to do. So for some of the more people that have been more active, they've enjoyed seeing us experiment with this medium. Um, it's, it's been a help. It's, it's so much fun uh, because we're really inventing something that we think is cool. It's not like anybody else has gone here. This is somewhere that, and, and there's there's a double edged sword there. You know, like the risk of innovation is innovating, which is, I don't know, things could be tuned better at times, but you don't have any baseline to 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 work from. So you're basically giving it your best shot, and as you go, you're trying to tune it and make it a little bit better. But as we go, we're learning a lot, and, and I think it's been really fun. But pushing the boundaries of Web three is kind of our goal. So if you look into the future. You mentioned Angry Birds earlier in the interview. Where do you see this all going, hopefully for killer bears? Yeah, for sure. So right now, I think that we've done a really good job developing the, the core Web3 ecosystem and community and, and all of that. And in the background, we've been working on a lot of things that are much more Web2. We're making a lot of progress. There's, there's I can only say so much, but there's obviously discussion about a film. Um, there's some stuff we've shown with fashion. There's in real life events like our event at NFT NYC that was incredibly interactive and immersive. Um, you know, there's toys. We've, we previewed those, you know, physically in, in, in the space at the event at NFT NYC. I think all of that stuff is, is going to happen. It, it works at a different pace. The web three pace is like one month in, in, in the real world is like, is like, you know, a, a year. Uh, it's it's crazy. Uh, obviously, wait, Web two. Wait, wait, oh, so you mean like one month in Web three is like a year in Web two? Is that what I mean? Is that what I'm hearing you say? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, it could even be more exaggerated. It's really. I've got. You can't really see him here, but I got my first gray hairs this year, and I and I, and I think that I think I think it comes from that 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 pace. But um, yeah, I think my hair accelerated. My forty year old brother, who's older than me, uh, has no gray, so I know that I've done this to myself um hey man it's distinguished <laughs> you look yeah no i'm ready for it I, I, my, my wife loves the salt and pepper thing that that's starting to happen uh but um i think what's interesting is is how and no one's cracked it um uh, is how do you do all those web 2 initiatives but how do you like really truly marry them to the web 3 experience community everything and we have a lot of ideas on it um I have talked to a lot of attorneys about how to do it in the right way. And I think that that's like a huge area uh, to, to, to work through and understand and, and try to make some headway. And, and we're definitely going to do it. I think that there's a lot of, I think for some of the entrepreneurs and creatives listening, I think that that's actually like a really important area to think about is how do you link some of these real businesses that exist out there and how do you combine them and connect them to Web3 audiences? Uh, I think that there's a, a, an incredible world of opportunity. I wish I had like a, a clone of myself that I could do some of these other things, but uh, you know, that's not going to happen. But um, that's what's really interesting to me. And I think that you know all of the media, all of the product, all of that stuff that we want to do, we want to leverage the intellectual property that we have of our community and the storyline that we've been developing and all of the lore and, and connect it all meaningfully. 
Uh, ben, this has been really, really insightful. If people want to connect with you on the socials, do you have a preferred social platform? And if they want to learn more about Killer Bears, is there a place you want to send them? For sure. So on the Killer Bears piece, uh, I think a great place to start is killerbears.com. From there, there's a lot of information. Uh, there's links to Twitter, Discord, whatever you'd like to see. Um, all the different you know Web2 things that we've been working on, all the initiatives. There, there's information about them there. Of course, links to the collections. And personally, I think Twitter is probably the best way. I spend more time in DMs there than I do email these days. So my Twitter is uh, Mr. Underscore Ben FT. So M R underscore B E N F T. And uh, yeah, pretty active on there. So just uh, jump into the DM and, and we'll talk. Ben Cohen, thank you so much for coming on the show. Really appreciate your time today. Thank you, Mike. Great chatting. Talk to you soon.